Good afternoon and welcome to this special edition of Slave Food, where Slave Food is in the Bronx today with the Willis Avenue Seventh-day Adventist Church in Bronx, New York, where Dr. Richard Means Jr. is the pastor. Uh, my name is Kibia Myers and I'm the health ministries leader of Willis Avenue. And I wanna welcome everyone for joining with us today. And we're definitely going to have a blessing by the presentations with, with our guests, Dr. Uh, Columbus Baptiste and Dr. Eric Walsh this afternoon. And I just want to thank them in advance for um, being and joining with us today and being a part of this um, afternoon program. Um, the special uh, topic is going to be dealing with um, COVID-19, you know, and the threat of the second wave and how it affects um, communities um, where there are disproportionately um, amounts of people who have these diseases and um, negative outcomes. So the black and brown communities and how it affects, how it affects us. Um, so without any further ado, I'm gonna invite everyone to please bow your heads as we begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious heavenly father, thank you dear Lord for this blessing this afternoon. We invite your presence to be with us as we, we converse and learn about how it is we need to prepare ourselves and protect ourselves from dangers seen and unseen. And we pray that you will help us to fortify our health and our strength so that we continue to do your work. We pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm going to uh, thank you and invite, um, welcome Sister Danette. Uh, Baptiste, our moderator for the evening. And, um, and yeah. I'm going to let you take over from here. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. We appreciate you and the invitation from your church family. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Slave Food Project, it is a journey of two African-American physicians as they examine the role racism as a unique form of stress and the weaponization of food in the creation of health disparities in the African-American communities, irrespective of income. They discover eating a whole food plant-based diet in urban communities is possible and is the key to eliminating health disparity. Um, as New Yorkers pick up the pieces from the earlier devastation of COVID-19, and as we understand, um, even the, the Willis Church has, um, has experienced the loss of Sister Verna Collins. Um, the doctors want to discuss how properly addressing the role of stress, discrimination, and food injustice can provide each of us the strength to fight. We invite you to join this conversation as we move into the flu season and arm ourselves with the tools we need to understand and resist health disparities. The doctors today, as you know, will be Dr. Columbus Batiste, who is a board certified cardiologist and chief of cardiology in Southern California. His mission is to share the information so that each one can teach one about the benefits of plant-based nutrition, daily exercise, and stress. We are also joined by Dr. Eric Walsh, who was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He is a graduate of the University of Miami School of Medicine, Loma Linda University School of Public Health, where he received his master's and doctorate in public health. Thank you guys and have a great show. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, I'll go ahead and get up. All right. How are you doing, Eric? I'm doing good. Looking forward to this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, me too. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, uh, first of all, I want to give yeah, a good welcome to the New Yorkers out there, the Bronx, to Brooklyn, to all those folks. I've actually never been to New York. <laughs> I was I was supposed to have been in New York for the first time, my wife and I, for a conference I was I was scheduled to speak at beginning of, which of course we know got, uh, got canceled. Uh, so this is about as close as it gets. So virtually I'm in New York today. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, well, so we're, gonna, we're gonna go ahead. No, I was saying no, no. I'm very familiar with the Bronx, so um, 
really glad for us to be able to participate with the folk in the Bronx. And I know there are people tuning in from Florida and uh, Massachusetts um, and California as well. So glad to have everybody on. Um, and this is a special presentation of the slave food of the slave food project. Absolutely. So let's dive in. Let's dive into it. You know, one of the things is that what many of us do and we know uh, culturally is that we come together and we gather around food, around food many times. And so this question really, this purpose, this project really arose out of a conversation that transpired just around the dinner table. We were having friends over and the question came up really as it pertains to uh, having to have colonoscopy sooner, having to have prostate cancer checked sooner, the, the implications of breast cancer on communities of color. And the question that was born out of that moment was, why is it that Black people in America die sicker and sooner than other people? That's really the question that came about. And, you know, and as a corollary to it, and this is something that you always get into, Eric, is that what, you know, I, I, I saw this and I loved it. It's like, what is the greatest determinant of health? You know, so when you go down this road and you ask the question, is it a person's age? Is it their weight? Is it their cholesterol for heart disease? Or is it their zip code? What's the greatest determinant of, of one's health? And you've done a lot of work with your doctorate in public health. Tell us about, about that a bit. Well, what you find is that um, sometimes it's really not your genetic code. It's your zip code um, that uh, often determines these things. And so, you know, we look at this and we and you can see here, uh, depending on where you are in the, in, in New York, your life expectancy, expectancy is actually pretty uh, different. If you look in East Harlem, it's as low as 76 years. Um, but if you get out to Elmhurst uh, Corona, it's 84 years, um, even on the Upper West Side. So, you know, you can look at a map like this, and we do this for every city. We can often do this for cities all over the country. And we find that when you travel um, from different parts of the city to others, um, in Washington, D.C., if you go from the uh, Capitol Heights section all the way out into Maryland, um, you know, the life expectancy can change by like 20 years. Uh, basically yeah. a mile and a half, a, a year and a half for each mile you travel of increased life expectancy, you go from that part of town out into the suburbs. So it makes a big difference. It does. It does. And, and you know, growing up in South Central LA, you see the same thing. When you go from the West side, you go to South Central, you see this huge discrepancy based upon your zip code. And that's significant. That's there's what we see. And one of the things we talk about too, as well as we talk about what's interesting is that at every age, what we find is that African-Americans, they suffer, they live sicker than other groups. Ages of 18 to 34, all the way through to ages 50 to uh, 64, you see that you're more likely to have high blood pressure. You're more likely to have diabetes. You're more likely to suffer mm -hmm. with a stroke and the ill consequences of a stroke. You know, these studies, as you see here, 50 times more likely to, to have heart disease, things like Caucasians, 40% more likely to die at any age from any cause, 19% more likely not able to afford to see a doctor. You know, this is one of the major areas when we look at something called social determinants of health, which I know you speak to an awful lot. Yeah, and here you can see um, deaths for 100,000 people um, when you look at it by age and race, um, it, this is staggering and significant. Um, you just mentioned the social determinants of health. This is not because black people are genetically different. Um, and as you're going to see, a lot of things that you might consider as the cause of all of this actually are not the cause. Um, so we're going to go through this, but this just kind of drives home the point. That something really is different. Something is going on to create these disparities. And that's the crazy part. It's not just in one location. It's not just in New York. It's not just in the Bronx. It's across every state that when you look at, at uh, insurances across every state, African-Americans, people of African descent are more likely to die across all 50 states compared to other ethnic groups. And that's substantial. And here's the key from treatable causes from treatable causes that they're more likely to die uh, oh. sicker, living sicker and sooner. You know, and one of the things I'm a, I will transition and let you kind of get into this a bit more that we see oftentimes is that it's not just Amer uh, African-Americans are just a subset of the global picture. We know that as Americans, 
we also, mm -hmm. the, across the board, live sicker and die sooner than every other country, industrialized country, despite the heights of our technology, despite all those things, that what studies have shown is that 60% have at least one chronic disease and 40% have two or more chronic diseases. And so we, we, we've been impacted by this thing called the coronavirus, SARS-CoV, the COVID-19, this novel coronavirus. And Eric, you want to speak to that a little bit more as we kind of dive into this? Yeah, so coronavirus, of course, is coming and really, uh, I think what it's done is show the fracturing of the health disparities in this country. So um, the presence of coronavirus in America and the world has shown you, um, you know, where there's some weak spots in the world, but specifically here in America, probably more than anywhere else in the world, clearly um, we're having a major problem with African-Americans. This virus has taken over 900,000 lives. Um, and there's a lot nuanced to that, as we're going to talk about. Um, and you can see how it how it um, plays out on the map there. Um, and even this slide shows you that when you when you look at um, when you look at um, the coronavirus death rates compared to wars, um, so far it's really taken a lot of lives. Um, but again, there's more that we're going to reveal on this as we go through it. Um, and this is really what I wanted to jump to. This is what this is where it, it, it kind of gets interesting. In fact, just recently, the CDC put out a report showing that it was 96 point, I think, 5 percent or something like that. 96.1 percent of the people who died from coronavirus had some coexisting uh, um, coexisting condition. They, they had something else going on early on. And this is from New York. Um, we found that these were the conditions that were most likely to be present. Um, so. As you look at this, I want you to see hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, a history of coronary artery disease, kidney disease, dementia, lung disease in terms of COPD, cancer on down, um, what made it so that you were more likely to die, or, or if you died, you were more likely to have these, which tells you that there may be not just a viral component here, there may be a host component. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about is maybe the person getting the virus has some susceptibilities. Clearly, it looks like having these diseases would make you susceptible. Absolutely. And these diseases are the same diseases we just spoke about that African-Americans tend to be leaders in, that we tend to have the highest burden of disease that's present there. And this is something we've been struck with. We've seen this day in and day out throughout the course of this past year. 2020 seems as if it's been stretching out for, for decades and all the things that have transpired this year, <laughs> from the deaths of celebrities to the tragedy that struck our country, the uh, the fires that are raging throughout the country mm -hmm. as well. And we're seeing this, the impact in our communities on top of not to mention the social uh, unrest that's there. And here's one of the things that, that clearly has been shown in New York itself, New York Times kind of reported the, that we look at the inequities of the impact of the coronavirus. And it's not just New York. We've seen this in, in New Orleans. We've Chicago. seen it in Chicago. We've seen it all over the uh, the United States that there is a preferential attack. And what's you know what's interesting about this is that when the virus started off, there was this rumor that was going around that yeah. oh, so we don't get it. Affected, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, knew, I knew that was a lie up front. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that was crazy. But I also want to notice, just recognize on this slide, um, that Latinos um, yes. have really been um, the most, probably the most impacted by deaths per 100,000 or cases per 100,000 um, and disproportionately impacted um, in terms of deaths. So it's not just African-Americans. There are other people of color, specifically Latinos, that are also suffering pretty greatly. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, that's, that's, that's the interesting part is that not only those were the cases, those who have been diagnosed with it, but then you look at those who've, who've suffered with death, we get back to the zip code issue, that in counties where African Americans are predominant, that you have the predominance of black individuals and brown individuals, you see that the death rates and the death toll that strikes those counties is higher than when compared to the, the all of US and, and the, where we occupy less than the US average of occupants of a county. Hmm. That's significant, that's that significant. significant. And, then, and then moving on, still here, we see that once again, the same sorts of statistics, similar to before, not mm -hmm. only are we diagnosed with more cases, we're dying at nearly three times the rate of, of the majority of Caucasians when you look at the impact of the coronavirus that's there. 
across every age bracket, same thing. The number of cases per that are diagnosed when you compare, and what like to your point, the Hispanic, the black and brown, we have the lion's share of what's really happening inside this country. It's what studies have been shown. These are some of these are a little bit older data, but it's the most up to date data points that we have. And, and I think we, we should comment that there are a lot of reasons that's happening. One of them is if you don't have a job where you can work from home and you have to still go out and drive the bus, you still have to go out and work in the factory floor. If you're someone who ha who's less likely to be able to work from home, you're more likely to come in contact with someone with it. If you live in closer quarters and it's more yes. difficult for you to socially distance, you're more likely to come in contact with the virus as well. Um, and so there, there's a lot to that. Um, but we're going to show you that it's not just those things that can explain this away. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to that point, as a result of that, that lack of social distancing that you're forced because of your living existence, that many individuals, they have an increased amount of, of, of social network of individuals who've contracted the virus, right? So are you more likely to have family yep. and friends or people that you know? This is part of the reason that this may be the case. This looks primarily at New York and, and uh, Louisiana, but it's across the board, mainly in metro areas. And, and you get into that in some yeah. of your discussions about the, the metro and the, and the large city populations there. And again, this the, even just this slide will create a lot of stress for you if you know yes. people who are getting it, it's getting sick from it, and of course, if they're dying from it. Absolutely, absolutely. So same thing, these death tolls are just rising, black and, and indigenous Amer Americans too as well. We're seeing across every group that we're here, we're still leaders more likely to have it and to actually uh, many important times more likely to die from COVID. Yeah, so COVID. we're not, the, the Latinos beat us in some of these cases in some yes. of the ones we showed in terms of cases, but in this particular one from August, it shows you that African-Americans are actually um, the most likely uh, to die. And after us as, as Native Americans and then Latino Americans. So this is, this is, this should say, this says a lot about the condition of the country because the virus doesn't know what color you are when it infects you. So again, there's a lot more for us to unpack as we go through the talk today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Same thing. This is, this slide is powerful because it's looking specifically at the age groups again, that when you look across the age brackets, you're seeing that whether 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, at every group, African, African Americans tend to lead in terms of, of the death toll that's there. So we're gonna step back now and look at health disparities from a bigger perspective and try and maybe try and get to why coronavirus is doing what it does. So we know that from, from uh, 1990, there was a study um, where they showed that the death rates per 100,000 for people. And look at the age group, 35 to 54 years of age was 2.3 higher for African-Americans than whites. Obviously, this is long before coronavirus. This is just in general. They adjusted for risk for six risk factors, the smoking, high blood pressure, cholesterol, weight um, in terms of BMI, alcohol consumption, and diabetes. All of the things that most people say, that's why black people die sooner. When they did that, it did decrease, but it only decreased from 2.3 to 1.9 times, still basically double um, the risk. Then people say, well, it's because black people are poor and poverty comes with all these things. But even when you included poverty, it only went down to 1.4 times, still almost one and a half times more likely. And this left the, leaves about a third of the difference unexplained. And when you look at it then, um, yeah. Poverty control force still leaves in excess 38,000 deaths per year. And this is a little old. This is probably higher now. Or 1.1 yeah. million years of life, long, life lost among African-Americans in the United States. And we put in, because we, we're speaking for a group in the Bronx, we put in Heavy D in Mount Vernon just to the north of you guys. Um, Eddie Murphy's brother is from, um, I believe they're originally from Jersey. Um, and I forget the name of this rapper here from Brooklyn. Yeah, Fred the uh, Godson, yeah. And, and died recently of coronavirus. Yeah, at a so, young age. At a young age, so we know it's. I mean, some of these folk, Heavy D and uh, and um um the the Murth Eddie Murphy's brother, these are people with means. Um, we just use it as an example, but there are many, many other people we could put up here that have died early who are quite uh quite um um successful financially. So it's not poverty. Something else is going on. Correct. And it begs the question, why do these racial or what do racial disparities in health really truly mean? What does it mean? Obviously death loss and things of that nature, but what else does it mean? 
is a powerful slide here. You know, is that these massive unnecessary loss of lives, roughly an estimate, and this is probably once again an underestimate looking at this day and time from 2001, but about two, uh, the, the, the analogy of a plane crashing every single day, 265 deaths every day due to health disparities. That's powerful when you look at that. Premature deaths, families that are disrupted, you have income that's lost, a retirement that's not gleaned, and you have loss of, of passing of generational wealth or of knowledge that, that's lost as a result of some of these premature deaths. Yep. So like it's, it's every seven minutes, there's a premature death in an African-American in the United States, and it is expensive. Um, when you look at the cost of this, the Harvard Business Review looked at the cost of racial health disparities, and there's an, an there's an annual economic loss nationally, nationally um, including an estimated $35 billion in ex excess health care expenditures, $10 billion in illness-related lost productivity, and nearly $200 billion in premature death. Um, and so they're, they're saying, you know, there's a, we need to do something to change all of this. And that's from the Harvard Business Review. Absolutely. So we jump in and so we, you know, after we look at this and you see that even after you adjust for smoking, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, wealth, all, once, you, once you adjust for all that, there's still a gap. So we ask the question again, why do black people die sicker and sooner than everyone else? And the answer is stress. Um, and we're going to show you how stress not only ties to the health disparities we've known, but also how health disparities tie to the new health disparity uh, um, how stress ties the new health disparity with the coronavirus. And so we define stress, a lot of definitions of stress. The one I like is this one, stress is a condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize. And so we say, um, as, a, as, a, as an equation, we say, stress equals demands minus resources. Um, if you're under a lot of demand, and you don't have a lot of resources, your stress is going to be high. If you have a lot of resources, even if you have a lot of demand, you know, if you're a billionaire and you got a lot of you know, legal problems, you can pay for them and you're not going to get the stress someone without any money is going to have. So stress equals demands minus resources. And so how does stress work? Well, um, there's something called a fight or flight response. Many of you have heard about um, if you start getting chased by a dog, I normally tell a story about um, jumping through backyards in Connecticut as a kid, uh, trying not to get bit by dogs. Um, <laughs> and when you jump into somebody's backyard and you see a dog, this fight or flight response kicks in. And when it does, you got to release a cortisol from the brain. Um, adrenaline is released also from the adrenal glands. And all of a sudden, your pupils dilate so you can see well. And your heart rate increases to get blood around to your body. Your respiratory rate increases to increase the amount of oxygen you get. Your blood pressure increases to make sure your, ve your vessels constrict to make sure you get a maximum blood to the brain. While adrenaline helps you focus, you get more blood to the brain, use your brain better. Your liver starts making sugar. Uh, there's a whole cascade of events. Blood is taken away from your digestive tract and sent to your big muscles. So you're not trying to digest breakfast when you see that dog you're trying to keep from getting digested and so cortisol works to do a lot of damage um, if it is not regular not controlled meaning if you're in a constant state of stress your immune system is going to go weak your body's not going to prioritize your immune system you're going you're more likely to get heart disease high blood pressure just like we said and anxiety depression headaches all of these things happen um, <clears throat> when you are stressed chronically and constantly releasing cortisol. Absolutely. And that's why research, researchers are looking now more so at this relationship between chronic stress and the COVID-19. And this is one of the ways we see that that's happening. Uh, I, I won't, there's a lot to go through, but it's actually pretty simple. The one on the left in green is the normal stress response. When you get stressed, cortisol is released. And one of the things it does is it blocks your immune cells from producing a lot of things that inflame the body and kind of heighten your stress response. Um, and then if you jump over to the middle one, chronic stress will start to give you some pathology, meaning some disease. And you can see at the bottom here, um, the cortisol resistance of the one in the middle, all of a sudden you start getting physical stress, mental stress, you know, the stress, it turns a different color, it goes back up to you. By the third one, when you have chronic stress and chronic uh, and, and high cortisol levels, you get cortisol resistance. And after a while, what happens is your body can't turn on your 
your inflammation and your brain gets inflammation. You get oxidative stress that increases. Um, and when your brain gets inflamed, this is how young people get, uh, we now know get some forms of anxiety, depression. We know that with this inflammation can come, um, and especially if you eat a lot of saturated fat, your hypothalamus gets affected. You, you have a hard time regulating your appetite. You, you can't, and even your metabolism, you can't, you know, it's harder for you to stop eating. So when you look at this, I want you to, to understand that constantly being stressed causes disease. Absolutely. One of the things that we one of the things that we see inside this whole sequence is that it was interesting is that say scientists are are amazing right they sit there and we play around with rats and do all sorts of things they actually took a form of a virus a common cold called the rhinovirus what they did was they dropped it into participants' nose after they did a survey of what's their perceived stress and what they found is so in other words they all had the infection that was there but the question is whether or not they manifested the disease itself they had symptomatic colds and flus. And what they found is that when they dropped these droplets in there, those who reported high levels of stress, of chronic un uh, uh, unabated stress, they were more likely to manifest the disease and the occurrence. And the same went for those who were chronically isolated, those who did not have a social support, a network, whether or not. So we talk all the time about about physically uh, social distancing. We don't want to socially distance. We want to physically distance. That's right. You still want that social interaction is so key and important. And that's what many of these studies. So another study here, it basically looked at 324 healthy participants, very similar, that where they were given this virus, they were quarantined and they found out once again, the underlying stress levels were associated with an increased risk of getting sick. And so this is exactly what you're talking about. A study like that actually showed that you, you make less um, immunoglobulin A um, and that, um, that reduced the amount of immunoglobulin A as an antibody in the mucous membranes of the mouth and nose and throat that would normally catch the virus before it gets a chance to get in and make you sick. When you stress that, that, that immunoglobulin A drops and that's partly why you can get sick. Mm, yes, yes, yes. And this other one basically kind of showed really in terms of the impact of the angiotensin II right, is, is really truly impacted by stress and the elevated levels of angiotensin II are associated with more of a severe manifestation of the COVID-19 cases. So our stress matters. The way in which we perceive this idea of stress is demands minus resources, understanding, as you say many times, Eric, that our resources are greater than we ever perceive and what we have, the blessings that we have, that we have to be able to deal and comprehend our stressors and put them in context a bit more. Yep. So we, we'll go through these really quick. We know that chronic exposure to stress with poor social supports, which is why we say don't social distance, physically distance, keep socially connected, and limited social networks have been shown to increase disease risk. Low, low perceived control is a determinant of heightened stress responses and poor adaptation. We often ask who's, going, who's likely to die sooner, the CEO or the guy in the basement in the mail room. And people say, it's the CEO, he's got all the stress. No, the CEO has control. The CEO That's actually right. lives longer. And there's a really good book about that. Absolutely. And adversity and vulnerability, along with psychological markers such as low self-esteem and loneliness, are also associated with poor health outcomes. I want you guys to get this. When you look in the mirror as an African American or or, or a Latino, whatever it is, um, what you have to remember is that when you look in the mirror and you don't think you're attractive or you don't think you're worthwhile, that low self-esteem mm -hmm. actually subtracts. It is a stress that subtracts from your ability to be healthy. Mm -hmm. So racism is a statement about a person's value. And what we've learned in society, if stress equals demands minus resources, resources most often go where value is perceived. So here's a, here's a great example of that. When no, almost no one in our state, in Connecticut and across the country, people are having a hard time um, getting coronavirus tests, the NBA players were getting it. Um, <laughs> you know, um, And I'm sure there were a lot of other wealthy people in the country that are getting those tests um, because People look, hey, no, these guys are valuable. We'll spend the money. We'll, we'll put in the resource to get what they need. Um, and so a lot of times, this is one of the reasons why uh, racism itself is so stressful, because it means resources aren't going to go where they're supposed to. That's right. That's right. And um, 
really, this is a unique stressor. We put a um, kind of a montage of pictures here of African Americans who died too soon at the hands um, of law enforcement. And I, I, you know, I know there are a lot of really good law enforcement people who have relatives in law enforcement. Um, but I will say that this is a trend that has been that is obviously disturbing and stressful because if you are um, if you're African American, you have a son, or, or or even Columbus and myself, you go out, you're worried. I mean, could you be the next one that this happens to? Um, yeah. And we know the threat is on some level real, but even if it was just perceived, it's still a stressor. Um, and this is one of the things that really does impact the health of African Americans on kind of a um, at a thirty thousand foot level. It's just the, the worry that any of these things could happen to you. Absolutely. So it's like racism is a stress. It is a stressor on our system, on our body, whether or not we associate with the images on television, we experience them, or it's from stories that we've heard on a repeated basis. It does leave a toll on us, so much so that there's studies that have been done by Society Stress, uh, the American Psychological Soci uh, Association. And what they showed is that they showed that the stress levels continues to increase in terms of the percent of African Americans uh, or Black Americans who report discrimination as a significant source of stress. Now, this is what they perceive. <laughs> this is just what they perceive. It's not even the the microaggressions that are kind of going on with them inside the, each moment. Um, across the board, America as a whole, seven out of ten Americans as a whole, they are concerned. They're stressed. They're they're seeing that this violence, these acts of violence uh, towards minorities, is a significant source of stress. You know, I think it was Will Smith who who commented. He said, "You know, these things aren't new. It's just that we're taping them. That's the only yep. thing that's new about these things is that we're filming them now at this point. But the fact of the matter is, we're seeing it, and these imaging, these images are troubling to all of Americans." Yep. You know, one of the key things that we uh, that David Williams has done phenomenal work along with many other researchers across the United States in terms of the impact of, of racism as a form of a stress and the impact on our bodies. And there's something he developed called the everyday discrimination scale. So stop for a moment and ask yourself a couple of simple things like this. Say, you know, are you frequently treated with less courtesy than others? Are you frequently treated with less respect? than others? Are you frequently uh, receiving poorer service than others? People thinking that you're not as smart, people acting afraid of you just because you are who you are, people thinking that you're dishonest, people uh, acting better than you. These things are what they characterize as microaggressions. These are things that, that they, they exist beneath the surface, but can cause huge detrimental impact to your person and who you are. I, we give the story, there's many stories that we all, that I'm sure Eric, you could tell, that I could tell that have occurred in the in the hospital and, and in clinics with patients. And you tell a great, uh, not a great story, but you give a reflection from your time down in Alabama and things that transpire know. there. Um, and so this is real in terms of the impact. It doesn't matter who you are or what heights you think you've achieved. At the end of the day, these things can be impactful. That's right. So we talk about racism and stress. Um, racial discrimination is, Berkeley came out with a study said racial discrimination linked to higher risk of chronic illness in black women. Uh, Professor Amani Allen put out a, a study that says that. And women who said they faced racial discrimination on the job and housing or from the police were 48% more likely to develop breast cancer than those who reported no incidents of major discrimination. Hmm. There's another study of African-American women have found that those who reported chronic emotional stress due to the experience of racism had more severely blocked carotid arteries. And studies show increased coronary artery calcium scores in patients with racial discrimination stress. And Dr. Batiste is a cardiologist. I'll let him explain what the um, coronary artery calcium score is, but um, it increased the risk of heart attacks. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a, it's a marker. And so the one way I usually analogize is that if you have a garden hose at home and that garden hose is real flexible, you buy it from a, a store, or Walmart or from Lowe's or Home Depot, wherever the hardware store is, you leave it, leave it baking in the sun of the summer. That rubber may become hard and stiff, you can imagine. As it becomes hard and stiff, you can imagine in the body, calcium forms there. And so when we do this imaging, it's reflective of calcium, which tells us of a process that's happening throughout the body. And this is something that can be predictive of future heart attacks is what we know. And so that that's hugely problematic. I think 
this one here is, is the one that that's even more profound to me because you know i mean as people of black and brown descent many times we like to joke around saying listen black don't crack you look beautiful you're you know you, you you're 75 and you look like you're 25 and and all that stuff we know people who look like that but this study is so powerful because it tells us that when they looked at black women they had shorter telomeres and telomeres are like think of them as the caps on the end of your shoelaces and as those caps get broken, you're no longer able to intertwine those shoelaces through your shoe holes. And so when those telomeres are short, it's predictive of, of death. It tells us about death and, and so powerful when you all, I want you to go back and check out slavefood.org. I want you to go to YouTube and see Slave Food uh, Project on there. But one of our conversations we had, one of the professors who came on, they discussed the impact of these young kids, these young girls, 14, with lots of stress in their life lots of issues in their life and they measured their telomeres and they compared them to middle-aged Caucasian women who were survivors of breast cancer. And they found that these 14 year olds because of the stress had shorter telomeres than these middle-aged Caucasian women. Mm -hmm. And that's so powerful when you look at that. But there, there's hope that we'll, we'll tell you at the end of the story about this, that it's not, the story doesn't end just there, but there's, it's huge as it relates to it. One of the things that's so interesting with this is that we also see that racism as a stressor has shown its ugly head, reared its head in, in COVID. And these studies have shown that in individuals of Black and Asian, other ethnic minorities in the UK, they reported feeling more stress than Caucasians, even after encountering, uh, accounting for age and gender and working situation, they had disproportionate levels in deaths rather from COVID-19. And, and, and just, a, just a note there, uh, Asian era, a lot of times it, in, the, in the States, we think of like more, um, more like uh, people of Chinese, Korean, Japanese descent. But in when I'm in England, a lot of times, what they, what it's more South Asian, so it's more um, Indians Indian. and Pakistanis who often really do uh, feel a brunt of racism um, mm-hmm. that, that we, we, a lot of us in America don't understand. Correct. You're absolutely correct. That's a great point. Great point. You know, here's the other thing is that the, for this racism as a stressor in COVID is that these research has shown that young people ex- experiencing systemic discrimination it can trigger higher levels of the cytokines, which can it can magnify the impact of future stress on their health and so forth. What yeah, one of the things that stress does is this is an interesting slide for two reasons. We'll talk more about co- coronavirus in a little while, but we believe that it's bradykinin and in, in a, a bradykinin storm is mm-hmm. a cytokine storm that is actually probably causing the serious consequence of this disease. If young people are stressed and they already have high cytokine levels and um, th- that means that they're gonna, they're more you know you're going to be more prone to having a bad outcome from coronavirus, but even more interesting is when you're stressed, it actually makes the hypothalamus more susceptible to stress and all of the bad ravages of stress. So if you start this when you're young, as you get older, stress is going to actually negatively impact you more and more and more. Yes, 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 yes. And we'll explain more with cytokines, I think, on some of the later slides. We'll come back to that, I believe. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think a corollary to that that fits right hand in hand is that when you're looking at this idea of racism and stress, uh, yell. The public health they found that middle-aged women frequently experiencing discrimination had significantly higher levels of visceral fat putting them at high risk for serious conditions as heart disease and diabetes now here these are two of the major risk factors for COVID. now this is a certain point i want to bring up with this oftentimes you know there there's a scripture that says you know god looks at the, the hard man looks at the outside basically and the problem is we oftentimes like to look at people and say oh you're big you're small you're you're bad this person's good but there's something, a concept called thin on the outside, fat on the inside. It's the fat on the inside, it's the visceral fat, the fat that encases your internal organs that's much more metabolically active. It's much more detrimental to your outcome that's and right. what ends up happening with you. That's problematic. And so this idea that racism impacting middle-aged women can increase the burden of visceral fat is very significant as well as increasing the inflammatory state as you're bringing up before with the youth and the cytokines as well. And one of the slides I love, I went out, I visited Australia and was able to actually visit one of the health departments when I was working in public health. And uh, these posters just rang true to me that Australia has seen for their aborig- for the Aboriginal people there, that racism itself makes people sick. 
I mean, they actually put up posters in Australia. Racism makes me sick. It affects my blood pressure, creates anxiety and depression. And the young lady, it says, racism makes me sick. It damages my heart, blood pressure, and my unborn baby, which is a mm-hmm. profound statement for the you know government to put out posters like this. I thought this was profound when I saw it. That is. That's huge. I mean, so I think one thing it tells us beyond the shower, but that is that we know that our health is uniquely tied to our stress. Your health equals your resiliency over stress. So the higher your stress, life stressors, finances, uh, coronavirus, all these things like that, racism, the poor your health, right? The higher your stress, the poor your health is the key. Yep. And what do many of us turn to when we get stressed? <laughs> many of us turn to comfort our good food. old neighbors, <laughs> comfort foods, our, 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 our double dates with Ben and Jerry. We, we turn to, to foods because stress is simply dessert spelled backwards is all that it is. And that's what we turn to. And many say, I don't eat sweets, but you like your, your rolls and your processed foods that equate to the same thing. And, it, and so in, in other ways, we, we engage in something called nutritional stress. So now we deal with our stressors by adding in a form of nutritional stress. What mm-hmm. is nutritional stress? Nutritional stress is, it's sure, it's easy enough to kind of identify. It's eating disease-forming foods. It doesn't take rocket science to figure out what disease-forming foods are. But here's the key component of nutritional stress. It's not eating health-promoting foods. Foods that can embody, can embolden your body to fight, can fuel the, the, the strength to fight. That's really what it's about. The food we eat creates stressors in our body. And so much so that this now we have this collision that's occurring between the epidemic and the pandemic. And so now we have individuals, mm-hmm. as we have shown, Across the United States, 60% with at least one chronic disease, 40% of Americans have, have two or more chronic diseases, including obesity, that now what, what we're saying is one of the, the greatest threats to U.S. American uh, history is a poor diet. <laughs> is what recently an article that came out the past several months, and we're seeing this increase in the same things, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, that impact your immune system and increase your propensity towards this thing called sars cov and we know that the, the coronavirus is a disease of inflammation. Um, and one of the hallmarks of it is acute respiratory distress. So far, we've really focused on the cytokine storm that happens in the third fl- phase and the hyperinflammatory phase of the, of the disease. Um, and, and, you know, what we say is if you can understand inflammation and understand how to prevent, uh, prevent it, you, um, you might be able to prevent and treat um, the worst outcomes of this infection. And, it's, and that's one of the things is the fact that these these foods, these diets of what we're eating, it's really we're living and we're engaging in these weapons of mass destruction is what many of the communities that we, we've been born and bred inside of. And, and these, these foods that are just comprised of, of substances that we can't get away from. And so one of the things, you know, the, the cigarette companies were sued because the cigarette companies, the tobacco companies kept telling everyone their, their product is not addicting. Their product is not addicting. And they said that for decades. And of course, they were secretly making sure it was addicting mm-hmm. behind the scenes. But the food companies don't hide like that. And remember that many of the food companies are now actually owned by these conglomerates that are part owned or owned by the tobacco industry. So it's not like separate things anymore. Somebody's trying to addict you again. And the food companies, where the cigarette company said, um, you know, our stuff isn't addicting. The food company says, I bet you can't eat just one. They tell you right up front, you once you pop, you can't stop. Um, and so they're trying to pull you in. And the food companies exploit our biological preferences with formulas that maximize sugar, salt, and fat content. Remember, if you were living, you know, 300 years ago and you had to figure out where you're going to find food, something was sweet. You wanted to eat a lot of it because it was berries, high in antioxidants, um, good um, sugar combined with fiber. Not so anymore. And they've hijacked those systems to actually literally like manufacture addiction. They've hijacked. Mm -hmm. Um, our normal reward path in our brain through the chemical dopamine, which is the neurochemical that tells you you're of, about pleasure or euphoria. It's the same one cocaine hijacks when you become a, a, a cocaine addict or when you use cocaine. And they've used this to try and actually make food um, just as addicting as that. Absolutely. They've essentially created this, this level of addiction that we've become enslaved to our desires. I mean, and, and people oftentimes they'll pause at the word slave food when we say it when I, I mentioned this and, and I asked folks, 
what happens when you tell yourself you're going to eat well? What happens when you tell yourself you're not going to have that candy bar, that soda, that somehow you're you're addicted to it, you're chained to it, that that despite the consequence of knowing that it's going to impair, impede your process towards weight loss, that it's going to keep you healthy, preventing you from having the diabetes or whatever it takes for heart disease, et cetera, you still go back to it. You yep. still go back to it. You fall into it on a consistent basis. And these pictures here are not by mistake. When we look at those most addictive or, or those foods that are most pizza. desired, you're looking at pizza. Mm -hmm. That's a mixture of the sugar, the salt, the fat that's there. You're looking at chocolate cookies. You're looking at the popcorn. You're looking at the chips, the burgers. Those are all the things that truly are, are, are addictive. And this slave food is just that. It is the, the manipulation of nutrition for profit and for power. Uh, there's a there's a quote that one one guest came on and told us from South Africa, Mark Malcolm Speller, is that the the business of business is business. <laughs> that 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 these agencies, these food this companies, they these sold <laughs> industries, this is what they do. They're they trying make to make money. money. Yep. They're trying to make money. And even if it, even profit. if that's your, even if it's at, not just at the expense of your pocketbook, they want to make money at the they will make money at the expense of your health. Um, Absolutely. And it, and I want to say this again: it is designed. The, 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 there's no accident about these food. There are scientists, food scientists, working to engineer and design this food so that once you start eating it, it's difficult to stop eating it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the, the other key thing is the fact that you ever notice that in certain neighborhoods, you have different things that are advertised on sale at the front of the store, certain things that are available. Right. Do you ever know what strategically places you're waiting in that long checkout line mm -hmm. that's, that's right. there? That's specifically tailored to you down to your taste buds af as an African-American female in this age group. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. That that's the power that they put behind this. So um, the food and beverage industry will spend about $2 billion every year marketing food to children. Why? Because they know there's something called loyalty, brand loyalty. If they get a kid to like Snickers when they're four, that kid will be eating Snickers in college. And they'll be <laughs> eating Snickers um, when they want a snack when they're 40. Um, so that's the first thing. They want to get you hooked to Coke or Pepsi. They want you to pick one. And you pick it when you're young and you stick with it for life. They've got a customer for life. The fast food industry spends more than $5 million every day marketing unhealthy food to children. Nearly all, 98% of food advertisements viewed by children are for products that are high in fat, sugar, or sodium. Most, 79%, are low in fiber. Mm -hmm. And there's one study that actually showed that when children were exposed to television content with food advertising, they consumed 45% more food than children exposed to content with non-food advertising. Advertising has an immediate effect. But here's the real kicker. African-American children actually see twice as many calories advertised in, a day in fast food commercials as white children. So we say, well, how is that? It's the same TV. Well, there are channels that our children watch more, like BET. Um, that would be one way. But more importantly, on average, African-American children watch more television every day than other children in America, um, definitely more than Asian and white children. So uh, that's one of the ways that it happens. And the last I checked was like eight hours a day on average. Uh, so you're going to be advertised to a lot. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll read this because I love this quote from Joel Furman. Um, uh, who wrote the book Eat to Live, he, it says the modern food and drug industry has converted a significant portion of the world's people to a new religion, a massive cult of pleasure seekers who consume coffee, cigarettes, soft drinks, candy, chocolate, alcohol, processed foods, fast foods, and concentrated dairy fat, cheese, in a self-indulgent indulgent orgy of destructive behavior. When the inevitable results of such bad habits appear, pain, suffering, sickness, and disease, the addicted cult members drag themselves to physicians and demand drugs to alleviate their pain, mask their symptoms, and cure their diseases. These revelers become so drunk on their addictive behaviors and the accompanying addictive thinking that they can no longer tell the difference between health and health care. And this is a reality when we talk about it. We want universal health care. What I want is universal health. Um, and so, you know, we want to build an America where everybody is actually healthy. Absolutely. And these components, these things, these evil trinity, as they like to call it, sugar, sugar, salt and fat. That's really what abounds in the foods that can lead to our detriment. And what says have shown is they've shown that, yes, people often, oftentimes want to attribute a salt sensitivity gene, which does exist as the sole component 
to hypertension and things of that nature. But when you look at genetic relatives and you start off from Western Africa and you move through the West Indies all the way through to Americas, you see this slow increase and rise in blood pressure elevation from a low of 16% prevalence in Western Africa to a height of 33% in the US, so much so that the rate inside of West Africa is lower than that of the Caucasian population. So there's mm -hmm. other unique factors that are going on. But what we know is that this salt not only increases the blood volume in your system, it not only impacts, it can impair something called the endothelium. That's a special lining of the vessels of your of your body. And all roads lead throughout the body uh, from the heart to deliver blood flow. And so we know that salt can impact these the neurons in the brain. It can impact, like I mentioned, the, the lining of the vessels causing mm -hmm. dysfunction. And for them to spasm down to as well, it can impact the kidneys um, as well. So there is a huge impact even beyond the thought. And here's the key. I always ask everyone, how much sodium is inside one teaspoon of salt? How much sodium? We don't think about it, but it's 2000 milligrams. So when you are out there and you're cooking by ear and you're putting a dash here, a sprinkle there and a, a touch here, you have no idea how much you're putting in. Then you add dashes of salt on top of the food that's already been salted, that you're we're adding to our detriment by the constant consumption, the overconsumption that's there. And that we know that just by reducing a small amount, we can save millions of lives. That's by right. reducing a small amount that we can, we can lessen the death uh, and the disability from disease. It's so substantial when we look there. We look at sugar. Sugar's hard. I'm a recovering sugar alcoholic. I'm I'm quickly free to admit that. I love sweets growing up. That was my thing. That was my thing. I can still remember some of the ice cream shops I would go with my dad as a kid. And and sugar can have a huge impact. We know it's addictive, and it's been shown to be on par when they did studies with rats, comparable to some of the, the drugs out there, cocaine and others that are there, that when you have this sugar and you ingest it, right, now your blood sugar spikes up because now you've given your body any and everything. And your body was like, okay, now it turns that, that, that substance into like sludge as it's unable to absorb it and take it into the cells appropriately. The blood sugar levels fall and then you crave it more re readily and quickly. And so now all of a sudden this temporary resource you think you've given yourself to offset the stress as you're eating this, this donut, this candy bar, this drinking this soda, it dissipates quickly and leaves you empty and hollow wanting more in that moment. And then you're feeling down in that, at that particular time. And as a result of this added sugar, you increase the likelihood you're going to have to see people like me. It increases the likelihood nearly four times that you're going to have heart disease, that you're going to have an increased risk of, of events that, that, that will uh, occur. It's powerful. And with the coronavirus, you really don't want to eat sugar. I tell my patients, uh, you know, I work in urgent care. And when people come in with coughs and colds and stuff, I tell them, listen, you don't want to eat sugar. The way that your white blood cells work is, as you can see, number one there, they actually identify the toxin. Let's say it's a virus. It's, they surround it. That's what you see in number two. And number three, they engulf it. The virus is now inside of the white blood cell. The white blood cell uses vitamin C to absorb the toxin, and then it's ready to start again. Now, what happens when you eat sugar is sugar gets into the cell um, and competes to get in vitamin C. And so when, when no sugar is around, um, there's 50 times the concentration of vitamin C. When there's, when there's sugar present, it's only 13 times. So now the white blood cell can only destroy about 25% as many virus and bacteria. What I tell uh, my patients is, listen, one of the things that happens is every time you eat a Snicker bar, for the next six to eight hours, uh, most of your white blood cells are going to go to sleep. And, one, and it, it, I don't think it's a coincidence that after October 31st, you have this massive national gorging on sugar because of Halloween, mm. and all of a sudden our flu season kicks in. Um, mm. and there may be some correlation because then it's Thanksgiving, then it's Christmas. I mean, you just roll boom, 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 boom mm. uh, for the next month. These massive surges of, of sugar intake and kids are in school in co close quarters up until this year. So these viruses are able to spread because nobody's able to fight them the way they should be able to. This is why diabetics who have high blood sugar levels get such terrible uh, infections and have a hard time fighting them and recovering from these infections and sometimes wind up getting infections to their bone and actually having amputations. Yeah. No, that's that's deep. It's huge. I mean, I love that slide. I love that information that was put out many years ago as it pertains to that. But we look at fat 
And a lot of times we oftentimes attribute the fat just solely to animal products, but it's it's a whole conglomerate. We're looking at just the amount and people oftentimes say, well, I don't, I don't use lard anymore. I don't use butter, but they're using, and, and I heard you're supposed to have lots of olive oil is good for you. So I have a big vat of olive oil and it's not, we're looking at the amount of calories per tablespoon is 125 calories. The impact of what it has and what most people are doing with those oils and fats is they're frying their food. They're yep. frying their veggie meat. And here's the thing, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a little tangent for a moment. We're so quick to cri be critical and, and fall in line with a particular group. We say we're, we're vegan, we're vegetarian, we're gluten-free, we're, we're whatever it is. The enemy is the, sta the standard American diet. The enemy is the standard American diet full of salt, sugar, and fat, ultra refined foods, highly fried too as well. And so I don't care what version of it that you're engaging in. If it's vegan, vegetarian, it does increase your risk substantially. And so what we're finding that no, yes, indeed, it's not just the fat. We're finding it's way deeper than that. It's in way deeper than that. Yeah. Yes, it's in the meat itself as we look at this, the carnitine. And this carnitine can be found in many substances, but it's more uh, centralized in animal products. And this thing called trimethylamine oxide is actually produced from the ingestion of animal products, and which is found in, in animal meat tissue. And this is processed inside the, the liver and inside the intestines to produce this trimethylamine. It's oxidized, and that itself is what can lend itself towards increasing the burden of atherosclerosis, that uh, cal uh, calcified coronary arteries, like we talked about before with racism in the calcified coronary arteries, but also looking at the kidneys and heart failure too, as well as what we're seeing. And here's the thing, is that these, these things become so powerful and can impact us that at least it, we're thinking that it will likely lead to adverse outcomes is what we're seeing. The other thing I want to mention here is endotoxins. And, you know, as we were do, do research for these talks, some things blow me away. I mean, I grew up eating a lot of meat. My mother tried um, to make us vegetarian a few times. But in general, <laughs> um, her Jamaican upbringing, she'd feed us liver and um, all kind of stuff I won't even mention now. But, um, you know, some of the stuff really was was was, ex was extreme meat, and <laughs> steak and eggs and stuff that she thought was like the, like like a king's breakfast to give us. And what we find, though, is that this meat is actually full of bacteria, 100 million bacteria per quarter pound of beef. The endotoxins that exist um, in the meat exist even after you cook it and even after it hits the acid of your stomach. The endotoxins don't go away. So these endotoxins uh, cross the blood, cross the gut wall uh, because of the saturated fat and meat. The endotoxins get across. That's why some people think, well, it's well, if you just get rid of the fat, the fat's what's bad. It's both. And and for those yeah. of you, since we're talking to a church and in, in, uh, a church audience here, remember that the Bible forbids the consumption of fat. It says not to eat the fat of the animal. It says that more than once. Um, and now we know why. When you eat it, the endotoxins in the meat literally are more easily absorbed through the gut wall, go into your body and cause inflammation. And remember, it is inflammation that causes the cytokine storm, um, the overreaction of the immune system that causes the inflammation that causes a lot of the damage from something like the coronavirus. So when you eat meat, you trigger inflammation in your body through a number of mechanisms. This is one of the reasons why meat shortens the life expectancy. Correct. Across the board, multiple studies have shown that. Now, this is an interesting study. And there's, a, there's, I'll tell you, with this SARS-CoV and the coronavirus, we're having lots of research that's coming in and new hypotheses are coming out constantly. So one thing we know is that there's something called the ACE2 receptor. Think of it like your keyhole. And the coronavirus, which is this spiked globular protein or, or, or virus, attaches to the ACE2 it's in order to enter the cell, and that leads to all of this horrific issues. But what scientists are starting to find out is that it also down-regulates these receptors once it attaches. The lack of the receptors heightens the occurrence of disease and inflames it. And so one of the things that they found is that when you engage in eating uh, a component called resveratrol, right? And that you may mm -hmm. recall that from prior, prior uh, 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 advertisement and so yep. forth, but it's primarily, it's found in grapes, it's found in, in, in nuts and so forth that are there. Dark berries. But, Yes, but also when you look at saturated fat, right, that low levels of saturated fat upregulate it. So the presence of resveratrol, the, the low levels of saturated fat give you more ACE2 receptors and perhaps as a hypothesis, which is floating now, may decrease the severity of events. 
So your diet can impact the ACE2 receptors, which can therefore impact the severity of events in your vascular health as a general. And but but specifically for coronavirus, this is how coronavirus gets into the body is through the ACE receptors. So if um, it may be that the more of these ACE receptors you actually have that are functioning, um, the more you can kind of dilute down the effect of mm -hmm. the of the of of the attack of the virus. Um, um, so because we know that people who are on ACE inhibitors seem to do wet worse. Those that are on drugs that actually target this this receptor. So um, for a lot of reasons, you want to definitely be eating a lot of resveratrol. But that saturated fat from animals not only does it do this, it crosses the blood brain barrier as we said earlier, causes inflammation in the brain around the hypothalamus, literally makes it harder for you to control your appetite. Why would we keep eating? this saturated fat. And again, biblically, even if you decide you're going to eat meat, the Bible says not to eat the fat of the meat. And now you know why. Mm -hmm. And this is a simple slide. It just, it just shows that simply African Americans, more than many other ethnic groups across the board, with perhaps the exception of, of, beef. of, 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 of yeah, beef, we lead in terms of our consumption of the various types of animal products from fish, turkey, chicken. Of course, we lead uh, astronomically. <laughs> and poor <laughs> chicken. And, and, and let me say this, and when we're looking for reasons why we have health disparities, we, we push the idea of, the, of stress and racial stressors, but we can't, we can't underestimate what it might mean if Black America actually took on a whole food plant-based lifestyle. How much of those disparities, the difference, would we be able to erase? And I believe we could re erase all of it and maybe more. Absolutely, absolutely. And because the thing is, the foods that we're putting in our body that we feel as if we're attached to are causing detriment. And we look at this thing of meat and cancer, the risk of class one carcinogen from the deli meats, from the, the sausages, the bacon, things of that nature. But even as a class two A carcinogen, the level that's there. And why would we expose ourselves? And I tell folks all the time, you wouldn't take your loved one to a hotel riddled with asbestos because of the risk that's there. So why would you do anything else? Because these meats increase the burden of disease across the board heart disease, diabetes, colon cancer, prostate cancer, bladder cancer. Is it worth it in that moment becomes the question. And I, I was on a, I did a, a talk for um, the church in Framingham, Massachusetts earlier today. And there was a question that came up about milk. And I told him, make sure you tune in. So I hope you're on because this is one <laughs> of the slides I really wanted you to see. Um, this is the impact of the consumption of cow milk. Uh, 61,433 women, 45,000 plus men followed for more than 20 years and 11 years respectively to women longer. Among women, for each glass of milk consumed, the risk of dying from all causes increased by 15%. Mm. Risk of cancer increased by 7%. Why does that happen? One of the reasons is, of course, the, the way that cows are raised, the steroids they use to help raise the cows fast, what they feed the cows. But do not forget that there's a chemical, a protein in milk called casein which is designed to make a calf into a cow. The ratio in cow's milk is higher of casein um, uh, casein to the other uh, milk protein, which is um, slipping my mind, uh, whey protein, the higher casein level to whey protein. And that casein in the cow is designed to make a calf a cow. When you drink it and you have a mutated cell and that casein hits your mutated cell that can become cancer, cancer is just going to explode. It's like giving gasoline to it because that's what yeah. casein is designed to do. Yeah, that insulin growth-like factor is kind of triggered from some of these products. Yep. That's absolutely correct. And this one, the, the for women who consume three plus glasses of milk per day compared to those who consume less than one, the risk of dying increased by 93%. With men had a 10% increase of risk of dying with consuming three or more glasses of milk uh, per day compared to less than one glass of, of milk per day. There's, it's, the question is, got milk? Nah, I'd rather got life and, and not go that way. <laughs> yeah, drink, drink, the drink. Instead of milk, look at the um, nut milks, almond, cashew. Um, if you can't do nut, there's rice milk, hemp seed milk, um, oat milk, um, soy milk. There's other milks that you can do. And don't, we, we might get a chance to talk about soy later on, but, but um, definitely try to try some of those other milks instead. Absolutely. Eggs are a big one that are there too as well in terms of their risk that, that's there. I know Eric, you talk about um, the, the, the impact of eggs and looking at prostate cancer, but also yep. we know it impacts cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes too as well. And the question just really once again is, um, is it aiding to your health or is it feeding the good guys or is it feeding the bad guys? That's ultimately, when you're eating food, is it feeding the good guys or is it feeding the bad guys? Is it worth that balance for you to have it? Yeah. 
All right. So, you know, one of the key things is that we have to really consider having a change of heart and moving away from some of these highly processed refined foods, as we've yep. discussed already, filled with salt, sugar, and fat, and really have use our nutrition for resiliency instead of stress. Because remembering, our health equals our resiliency divided by our stress. So the things that we add to our resiliency, our uh, things that we add to our stress can impact our health substantially. That's there. And one of the things is because, listen, we all understand that there is a beginning and there's an end. It's a book cover. We know there's a beginning and there's an end. And so it's how you live in the middle. And can we increase our health span? What we know beyond a shadow of a doubt is that the average American's life is truncated in terms of their health span by 20 plus years that they live. But now all of a sudden their, their calendar is revolving around doctor visits, <laughs> that their, their food is revolving around their medication ingestion. That's there. And so the question is, can you live the life that you want, doing the things, being able to live a life of purpose? And that's where the food becomes important. Mm -hmm. Can we increase this? And so studies have shown that we have. There's a, a scientist there, a physician scientist, and the, the name of Dean Orris, he performed admirably. He first started out in heart, but starting here in terms of, 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 of prostate cancer, he showed that individuals who adopted a whole food plant-based diet, which means it's foods with singular names. I always joke and I say, we know people by the name of, uh, of, 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 of Ewing, Patrick Ewing, right? Ewing is, we know him by name if we're inside, or we know, we know Manning, right? But for those in Chicago, they know him, they know Jordan. <laughs> for those inside New England, they know Brady. We know him by singular names that are there and they're celebrities. Well, you need to know foods that have singular names because those are the celebrities of who you need to ingest, broccoli, yeah. kale, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries. And so he put those folks on those diets and showed that their PSA levels declined. He put those folks on there and showed that all of a sudden their blood was able to gobble up the cancer cells a lot faster compared to those who were left on the standard diets that were there. And so hugely powerful. He showed that you could reverse heart disease, that all of a sudden the end result was that there was increased blood flow to areas of the heart that were previously deficient in people who engaged in eating healthfully, who worked on their stress, who got rid of smoking and who moved more than they sat. And that's the key. He showed that the studies from uh, Loma Linda University showed they called the Adventist Health Study. He said that when you move, the orange bracket from eating any and everything down to a plant predominant diet, all of a sudden the pounds begin to shed. That when you begin to move from eating any and everything down to a plant predominant diet, that all of a sudden your diabetes begins to dissipate, becomes better the, control. That, that's moving from the orange bar down to that bright green bar. And bright green bar comes down to make it Absolutely. clear to you. That bright green bar is the is is the most whole food and plant based of all of the other bars. And the other key thing to realize is that it's not an all or none. Yep. Don't give up because you say it seems too hard. I can't do this. You make small steps can be hugely impactful. It can be powerful. That's there towards your health. That when you move from that orange bar to the bright green bar, that blood pressure seems to dissipate. These are the same risk factors for COVID-19. Yep. That when you move from the, the orange bar to the bright green bar, that your cholesterol levels begin to decline, which is a marker of heart disease too as well. So powerful and so and such that what they did was they swapped the diets between uh, Africans living in South Africa compared to African Americans living in Pennsylvania. And what they found is that the Africans in Pennsylvania, the African Americans, had cur had precursors of colon cancer that were measurable, and they were able within two weeks to turn on and turn off the markers of colon cancer. So when the African Americans they turned off those markers when they put them on a South African diet that was primarily a plant-based diet. When they put the South Africans on the standard American diet, they turned mm. on the markers <laughs> of colon cancer within two weeks. Wow. There's power. There's power in our food choices and what we choose to do. And there's also power in our food choices and how we approach this thing called the coronavirus. And so one of the things we, we said that you have to really push is an anti-inflammatory diet, which is what we've been describing all along. Zinc is critical. A lot of people like to take zinc supplements, but I tell people you got to try and eat your zinc instead of just taking it as a supplement. Because what happens is when zinc is inside of the cell, 
the virus cannot replicate. I won't go through all of this except to just say that. If you have a lot of zinc in your cell, the virus can't replicate, so your disease will not spread because the virus can, is not alive in a true sense. It can't keep making itself. It needs your cell's machinery to make more virus. And if the zinc is in there, it can't do that. Um, and But it's not just zinc. It's, it's another compound called quercetin, which is found in um, the pigment of plant foods, um, specifically elderberries, red onions, um, spinach, kale, um, a lot of a lot of foods. I think we may have a list of what, all of the foods that have it. But when zinc and quercetin come together, a lot of people take the supplements. But there are other things besides the two. If you look at that blue, uh, the blue arrow there in the middle of the of the of the um, picture to the right. There are other things that also help. This creates a zinc ionophore where the zinc can pass through and get into the cell more readily so that the virus can't replicate if it ever gets into that cell. Eating these foods together make it work. You can take the supplements, but you miss a lot of other good stuff. For example, in turmeric, there's curcumin, and it is an amazing anti-inflammatory and immune modulator that will protect you against disease. In fact, in India, the rates of cancer are much lower, and some hypothesize it's not just that they eat so much more vegetables and fruits, because um, in India, only 7% of the population eats meat every day. But it's also because they have a lot of curry. And for those West Indians out there, the curry actually has power to help fight cancer. And we believe will also have power to help protect against the pro-inflammatory phases, the hyper-inflammatory phases of the coronavirus itself. So what foods are actually rich in zinc? Well, here you go. Beans, garbanzos, um, green leafy vegetables, asparagus, spinach, mushrooms like shiitake, criminy, and white mushrooms, um, nuts, pine nuts, almonds, um, pecans, walnuts, peanuts, hazelnuts, all rich in zinc. So foods you that's, definitely want to eat. That's right. That's why I have curry chickpeas in my on my pot right now on, in the uh, in the kitchen, right? So you combine the turmeric <laughs> along with the chickpeas. I got my zinc. I'm gonna get the other the, as, as well. You get there. everything. Yep, it's, that's it's right. Protective, and so are the whole grains. So when you eat, this is why you don't want to eat white rice, and you don't want to eat um, these stripped oatmeal and breakfast cereals. You want real whole grains, like Ezekiel four nine bread. Um, you want to eat that kind of stuff because this gives you uh, a lot of zinc in a whole nother form, even down to quinoa. So you see everything in here from um, brown rice to whole wheat bread to quinoa, all rich in zinc. Yeah. And we want to make sure that we're eating food that's making us chew. If the food we eat doesn't yeah. make us chew, that we can just kind of just put in our mouth and it dissolves. It just melts. It does not, it does not have whole grains in it. Yeah, right? and that's the, that's one of the those, key markers. We call those the disappearing calories. So when, you're, when it melts in your mouth like that, your body doesn't even register you ate anything, so you just keep eating. So fiber causes you to chew. The chewing actually helps to tell you that you're full. The other chemical we talked about here is quercetin. Um, which does a lot. It's anti-inflammatory. It's antioxidant. Um, does a lot. Um, helps build immunity. Um, but it's found in a lot of foods as well. And you can see um, that you can find quercetin in elderberries, um, red onions, white onions, cranberries, green hot peppers, blueberries, red apples, and the skin of red apples. So you don't want to skin the apple. Kale, all the way down. Pears and spinach. Even romaine lettuce, which doesn't seem to have a lot of pigment, does have a good bit of quercetin. Now, so when you eat a, a, some brown rice, the curry chickpeas that Dr. Batiste is talking about, and you make sure you put some onions and green peppers and spinach with it, you have just put together a, a, a meal that will actually help you fight against coronavirus. Absolutely. Won't get deep into mushrooms, except to say that mushrooms we have found um, have incredible benefits from improved cognition. It, like, in other words, your ability to think helps you get, manage your weight because it blocks angiogenesis. So you don't make the blood vessels needed to add fat cells aren't ever created. So it's harder to make new fat cells or to grow your fat cells. Um, so, and for the same reason, it fights cancer. So, but it, mushrooms are pro-inflam, are, are low inflammatory. They lower inflammatory, sorry, anti-inflammatory. Um, and these studies to the left, we don't have time to get into them today, but these studies on the left actually show you that um, the drug companies and others are starting to look at mushrooms yeah. as for a possible way to fight the coronavirus um, in medicine as well. Absolutely. There's there's a, a budding research that's really happening and looking deeply at a lot of the things. Even when we look at things like our green leafy vegetables, oftentimes we'll cut off the tops of our carrots, right? The green part and throw it away. And those are some of the most bioactive components. And what yeah. they've shown is that they're they're using them. They have 
this anti uh, angiogenic properties and to fight cancer and, and various things. This is so powerful as it relates to the, the, the green leafy vegetables because the green leafy vegetables, you look at things like broccoli, actually have been shown to stimulate the natural T killer cells, which mm. are some of the front line defense mechanisms inside your nose and your oral pharyngeal pass, passageway, your mouth and various things there to help offset these viruses that attack us. So the key is, is that many of these studies that we're reflecting on that have power to help with with COVID have been shown really in influenza. And, and so, yes, we're right. making the extrapolation over, you know, as, as things uh, relate to COVID, but these are things that are going to aid in your resiliency. Yep. And that's the key. They're going to aid in your resiliency because our goal ultimately is just one thing, right? Is that we want to build communities. We have to build communities. And so just like our former slides mentioned really the importance of these social right. networks and that in order for us to thrive, that when, when I is replaced with we, the illness becomes wellness that we have to buy, bound together as a community. There's one thing I oftentimes I kind of mention and this slide makes me remember it as we close up, is that Eric, just, Dr. Walsh described really the stress hormone cascade when you see a stressor and talked about the cortisol, the epinephrine, the stress hormones that surge and what they do to your body. But here's something else that the body produces when you're stressed. It produces something called oxytocin. Mm -hmm. uh, and oxytocin is this hormone that they characterize as the, the tend and befriend. It causes us to want to seek individuals who are like ourselves, to bind together, to have conversations, to move together as a force towards enacting change. That's what it does, this love hormone. By hugging, by smiling, we transmit that it actually can dilate the vessels. It can be reparative and restorative to the heart, and that's where there's power. So this idea of replacing I with we is so hugely important. That's there because we ultimately want to create black blue zones. Blue zones are the most long lived individuals across the world, centralized in North Carolina, North America, the only ones inside of uh, Loma Linda, California. But the other ones are in Greece, Costa Rica, Japan, uh, Japan that, that are there. But there's also one, you know, studies are showing we're seeing increased amounts inside of Alabama. Uh, down there in Huntsville, and we're seeing a conglomerate of individuals in their late 80s or 90s or 100s who are thriving. They're moving and living well. And so that's our ultimate goal is to, is to really truly create these black blue zones where we can remain and live a life of purpose Become right. is our goal. But we thank you. We thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you guys very much. Um, we have covered a lot of information. And so um, in this regard, I'm gonna actually work my way backwards with the questions and answers because some of the questions kind of came about when you guys first started to discuss, um, you know, in terms of some of the foods that we should and should not be eating. But before we get into that, I wanna encourage anyone and everyone who's watching, if you can and you have not done so yet, please go to our website at slavefood.org and if you fill out um, the contact information slip, you can ask and request the Planscription Diet, um, where it kind of gives you an, I, some additional information on how you can eat better and some suggestions on how to make some better food choices. So the first question that I'm gonna ask the guys today is with regard to, are mushrooms supposed to be eaten or is it a parasite? Yeah, I get this a lot. Um, I was speaking at a, a West Indian church once, and um, <laughs> they, 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 you know, they were saying, like in Jamaica, where you know, the only time they saw mushrooms grow was in a situation you don't want to see them growing in. So not all <laughs> mushrooms are to be eaten, um, but th there are some that can be eaten that are safe to be eaten. Clearly, all mushrooms should be cooked some. Um, they they are not to be really be eaten raw. They should be cooked um, to, de to 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 destroy um, some minor toxins that might be in them. And you don't have to eat mushrooms. I mean, but what the studies are showing is that mushrooms actually are very helpful in the fight against cancer. Um, also, um, like I said, actually help to limit weight gain. Um, so you don't have to eat them. Some people say, you know, they don't want to eat them because there's no seed in them and this and that. You don't have to eat them. But um, if you get the right types of mushrooms, they actually are beneficial to your health. So can you guys Absolutely, list some yeah. of the mushrooms that are that you can't eat? All the ones in the grocery store. <laughs> not the ones, you not the ones outside on the no. on the in the grass. I, I wouldn't not pick the them in your yard. Um, no. 
<laughs> the grocery store, those are those are good ones. And I'm telling you, when they they're doing a lot of work around treating cancer with um by using people by having people uh, do mushrooms and and different compounds from the mushrooms, even the coronaviruses we showed you. So, um, you know, again, you don't have to eat it if you don't want to eat it, but um, there is some benefit to them uh, for sure from what the studies what- show. And one of the things is that it has very small amounts. You're you know, vitamin D. Now, vitamin D, for the most part, you're going to get yep. from sunlight, Good right? Point. Just sunlight is primarily the, the method in which you're going to get vitamin D. But there's some small evidence that vitamin D is accumulated inside of uh, uh, mushrooms. So there's there's importance that's there. And we didn't really get a chance to touch on the impact of vitamin D deficiency inside of globally America, irrespective of where you live, and it's predominantly in African Americans too as well, and the relationship of that to being susceptible to the coronavirus. Okay, there is a question about how do you cook parsley? Parsley? It looks like a <laughs> so, parsley is what you spelled to us. Uh. <laughs> so I, I they meant par- parsley, but they oh, said okay. parsley. So I, 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 yeah. So, so I can I can jump in in terms of in terms of with parsley. So a lot of times okay. with parsley, I'll add it to. Well, it'll be added to other. Um, as as like seasonings or whatever else that are there to other foods that is what we put in and we'll put fresh parsley as we're making different patties or whatever else with different beans and and varieties that are there it may be added on top of a salad i may add it with a juice although i don't juice very often or into a smoothie um, and so you find unique ways in terms of cooking these sort of wild greens and herbs uh in combination eric i don't okay, know so the person uh, was asking the person was asking barley they said parley. Oh, barley. Barley. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I would be, I would be lying if I told you I know how to cook barley. Um, <laughs> but I do know that it is, a, it's a, it's a, if you, if you buy it non-GMO, it's actually one of one of the best grains, and you can take it and make um, flour and bread and everything else from it. So, um, I would imagine there's a lot of good cookbooks on how you would make it, but maybe Dr. Batiste has an idea. So I, I primarily, I, I don't necessarily have a miraculous idea for cooking barley in isolation, but what I've done with barley is I'll tend to have it as a part of a cereal with a multi-grain cereal with oats and rye and barley in it. And I love the flavor and taste with it um, that's there. We have done it for some cooking uh, uh, segments and it's just like anything else, a matter of seasoning it up and, and finding. But great, I, I haven't gotten my culinary chef uh, license there, but I there's Pinterest is phenomenal with all those things. Yeah. All right, we got a question. Can I pick the dandelion in my yard and eat it? I would advise against that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can say. I, um, I don't know if Dr. Batista has a different take on that. Well, I mean, I think if you know that is dandelion, if you're if you know, hey, listen, I planted some dandelions, and that way it's fresh because dandelions are going to be they're going to be fairly expensive in the grocery store. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll be honest. Last week, uh, my mom lives with us. And so she cooked up some collard greens, some mustard greens, uh, some kale, and threw some dandelions inside of it because if it gives it some, ex- uh, some mm. extra uh, a bo- a bolster. You know, you're getting your dietary nitrates, which can, can help lower your, your pr- propensity yeah. towards heart disease and blood, yeah, pressure. blood pressure. It can, it can help with cancer too as well. So there's a lot of power that's there in terms of some of these these green leafy vegetables that are, that, that are out there. Yeah, my problem <laughs> my problem is I'd pick a weed instead of a, <laughs> exactly the right thing. You don't, so, you don't know I what said, to I, can't, pick. I can't recommend it, but um, I'm sure my wife would know how to do it, but I can't do it. You can't do it. All right, there's a question about tofu. They want your thought. Um, this is from someone who is a breast cancer survivor. Um, and per her, her doctor with estrogen um, is not to be digested. So, what would you guys say to that? I, I, w- I definitely do not want to go against your, the recommendations of your physician. So, I would only say that, from what I know, these are phytoestrogens, and they do not work the same way as the estrogen in the body. So, I would say do some research yourself, yes. um, look it up. I, you know, I, you know, when I have talk to patients, I tell them it's not the same thing. In fact, um, those populations where they consume more soy in its whole form. Now, I'm not talking about soy protein isolates and super processed soy. I'm talking tofu, soybeans themselves, maybe tempeh, and that's about it. They actually, it's actually protective against breast cancer. So Correct. I would advise that person to go, you know, do the research themselves and check it out and then bring that research to your physician and, and have the, have the conversation. Have a discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
And I, I'm, I, I agree with that. I, you know, because our goal is not to give you distinct medical advice, but what we can tell you is based off the literature that we've reviewed, it shows that the tofu and the soy beans, as, as Dr. Walsh mentioned, in the whole form is very helpful and ab advantageous for the body, even in breast cancer. It actually blocks the receptors to prevent as far as the, the, the deleterious effects. So it's beneficial. I'll give you a site for you to go ahead and check out and to research. Take a look at nutritionfacts.org, yep. right? Nutritionfacts.org, and you can just search in the, in the search bar, soy, right, and, and breast cancer. And he includes in there a great deal of, of references. Absolutely. And not that you have to go and try and manipulate all of those, but you can perhaps ask your doctor, what does he, think, he or she think about those? Because I will tell you lastly, is that even the doctor for Angelina Jolie, if you all remember from several years ago, when she had the double mastectomy as she re realized she had the BRCA um, uh, gene and so forth, that she came out later on afterwards and really spoke about the power of nutrition and spoke about the power of things like of, of soy in the whole, whole form. Um, and so it's fairly wide known in terms of the beneficial effects that Dr. Walsh kind of mentioned about soy. Okay, um, the there was a question about, is it better to have canned or dried ch chickpeas? I would always argue the closer you get to the source of the food, it's the better. So if you have, you can get dry food and soak it and cook it, it's better. However, that's not always practical. Um, so if you get canned beans, and uh, Dr. Batiste talks about this a lot, you take it, rinse it, so you get the salt off of it, um, and eat it. Don't let not being able to, you know, cook, do the long cooking version, stop you from eating beans. Beans are literally um, one of the healthiest things that you can consume, and, and chickpeas are very healthy. Okay. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. I'm a big believer in convenience. You have to make convenience work for you. And so part of the thing of making convenience work for you is you may choose, I'm trying to be convenient. So I purchased frozen brown rice. I'll purchase frozen wild rice, frozen vegetables without any sauces or salt. I'll purchase canned beans with no salt. that are BPA-free cans too as well. And then like Dr. Walsh said, I'll rinse those off, toss them inside mm -hmm. of a glass bowl with the frozen rice and the vegetables. I'm good to go. And there you are. So it can be valuable to you, but it's going to be more cost effective purchasing the dry beans. And I'll be honest, they taste better yeah. when you cook when you cook them yourself. Yeah, they do because you can season them from the beginning. And he does throw those, that bowl of fry, uh, frozen rice in the in the microwave or something. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you trying to call me out like that? Because <laughs> somebody be like, uh, I tried what he said, but the frozen rice didn't seem right. <laughs> right, right. Now, this question came back when you guys were talking about eggs. And so the question is, what about eating just egg whites? So eggs are bad for you. From the yolk, of course, we all think about the fat and the cholesterol, which is uh, damaging all by itself. But we think that the reason it's bad and increase the risk of prostate cancer, and hence probably other cancers, is actually the protein, in the animal protein in the egg white itself. So when you eat egg white, you're not getting away from animal protein. Let, let, one thing you got to get is animal protein itself is a problem. This is why God did not include these things in the original diet. I mean, when he added animal protein into man's diet, man's life expectancy drops precipitously when you study the book of Genesis. So mm -hmm. it's the protein itself. Now, we talked about a lot of things in the meat. Eggs, white is very concentrated animal protein. How does, um, how does fresh fish contribute to any of the lifestyle diseases or COVID-19, fresh fish? So let me say about fish, and I know Dr. Batiste probably wants to chime in on this one too. If it's not farmed, so farm fish has a set of problems because of the antibiotics and other chemicals they have to use to keep all of those fish in a tight space um, alive. But fresh fish, when you pull it out of water, has bioaccumulated mercury. And the mercury, that heavy metal, causes disease. What a lot of people don't know is that there are types of fish that actually have more cholesterol than pork. Um, so fish is not something you eat, and it's like some super healthy food. People say, well, I eat it for the omega-3s, but you can get that from flaxseed and chia seed. So um, uh, fish uh, actually can increase the risk of certain diseases because, again, you're still getting animal protein, and you're still getting cholesterol. Yeah. Okay, and then there's a question on should we eat veggie meat? I'll let Dr. Batiste handle this one. I'll go. I'll go <laughs> after. If he's a sugaraholic, I was a veggie meataholic, so I'll so, go last. <laughs> so here, here, here's the thing that I'll, I'll start off by saying. You know, my ultimate goal for everyone is that you focus on what you are eating for your health. That's the key importance that's there. So your fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds in small quantities. Having those first and foremost. 
our next thing is that we want to move away from foods that are carcinogenic and known definitely to be toxic. And we know animal protein, as Dr. Walsh mentioned, definitely is. And there are certain ones that are cancer driven. They're carcinogenic. So when we look at, at, at uh, plant meat substitutes, right now we make the extrapolation that they're on par with eating whole foods. And we don't know that right now, that they're equally as helpful for you. As a matter of fact, there was a study that was done out of the major journal for cardiology called Journal of American College of Cardiology. And what it showed was it showed that individuals who ingested purely a whole food plant-based diet did phenomenally well. Those who ate meat but ate a robust amount of, of, of fruits and vegetables, whole grains did next level. Those who ate vegan junk food did poor. Now they didn't define that if it included the, the meat substitutes or not, but oftentimes what I've experienced is we fry it, we batter it, we, do, we put creams on it, and so it's very unhealthy. So I think the key is how are you going about eating it? And so being very mindful and intentional and self-aware of the process. And it may not mean that it's all or none. It may mean that, hey, you know what? I understand I'm going to have this, whatever it is. Um, and it may be slightly less helpful with the way I'm making it. Now, here's the last bit. There was a recently a study that came out, and I forget if it was from Stanford or, or where, somewhere on the West Coast, Berkeley, that looked at swap meat and found that perhaps that when you swapped out the animal products with the meat substitutes that you had in somewhat of an improvement in your uh, inflammatory markers. Um, so it definitely is, I can probably feel comfortable in saying it's better than meat, but in terms of ingestion on a regular basis, it's not something I would look to consume on a consistent basis daily. And my, my, my thing that, like I said, I, I, when I, I was like 17 when I went vegetarian, and that's really what I ate a whole lot of. It was um, is veggie meat, grillers and stuff. And what you learn, of course, is that they're, they're, they can be high in fat. They can be high in salt. And of course, they, a lot of them use soy protein isolates, which have also been shown to actually increase the risk of cancer. So um, they are better than meat. I mean, I think in the short run, the studies, as uh, Dr. Batista just mentioned, I think I was out of UC, USF, um, University of San Francisco, they showed that if you swap out these newer ones, um, and I think it was like the Impossible or the Beyond Burger, um, for me, it actually does improve cardiovascular um, indices. But um, the problem with them is they are still highly processed foods. Um, and so they're not natural ways to do it. It, it. The better thing to do, honestly, would be to figure out a way to use things like eggplant. And for those who eat mushroom, mushrooms, um, tofu, tempeh. Somebody asked a question in there, saw about tempeh and um, mm -hmm. whether or not it's fermented. If you're worried about it being fermented into alcohol, it is not. Um, so, you know, you can eat tempeh because you cook it. A lot of whatever the fermented products are, they're going to come out of it. And it's not it's not an alcohol based thing. Um, so I, I would, I, you know, I say, you know, the way I tell a lot of people is, you know, eat it. If you want to eat it after church on Sabbath, that's fine. Um, the, the, the veggie meats, when you go to somebody's house, but it shouldn't really be a staple of your diet. If you're eating that two, three times a day, you're going to have problems. I know someone who had a stroke, um, who was vegetarian, um, and in very good shape. And when they looked at their diet, what they found was the consistent intake of these products and the high salt actually probably is what caused them to have that stroke. So I would, you know, and that's anecdotal, but mm -hmm. I would argue, um, you know, it's something you probably don't want to be eating, uh, but right. once or twice a, a week or none at all. Okay. The first two, the last two questions that we're going to be able to get to today is um, they came earlier on the on the discussion. Um, why are people with dementia on the list to be more prone to be affected by COVID-19? Well, one of the reasons is um, a lot of the dementia that people get is actually what we call multi-infarct dementia. It's vascular. It's not uh, what people think. It's not really a purely neurological problem. And because it's vascular, that means that they have vascular problems in other parts of their body. Atherosclerosis, as the cardiologist would tell you, is a whole body disease. So if you have atherosclerosis, um, you're going to have a lot of those conditions that predispose you to having severe coronavirus. And that's why dementia is one of them, because it is a vascular disease, just like heart disease, just like kidney disease and other diseases. Yeah. And the pathway may be tied very similarly to diabetes, because when now it's characterized as really type 3 diabetes is the progression towards Alzheimer's. And so, like you said, for sure, the vascular aspect and component is huge. It's connected to the diabetes and the metabolism in our body and the cardiometabolic uh, inflammatory state there as well. Okay, so as we turn it back to you guys to do your summar summaries, 
um, there was the question about why are like if you were to sum it up in one word or one theme as to why blacks are more prone and susceptible to early deaths, what would that be? I'd say stress, <laughs> you know, and we we described distinctly throughout mm -hmm. this presentation that stress is multi multi layered. You have just stressors of life. You have this added unique stress of racial discrimination. And you have this third layer, which is nutrition. And that uniquely, we many people of, of color live in communities that are riddled with food, are labeled as food deserts, that are devoid of, of access to fresh fruits and vegetables, that are devoid of, of these health promoting foods and are littered with disease forming foods, fast food restaurants at every turn, the bodegas, the, the liquor stores and things of that nature. And so that's problematic. And those things contribute, I believe, to the health disparities uniquely in African-Americans. And I would argue it's, it's stress and our inability to mitigate it. Stress equals demands minus resources. So everyone is under stress, but who has the resources? Who has more demands? Um, and then we know what physiologically and pathophysiologically stress does. And this is one of the reasons we harp so hard on a whole food plant-based diet, because it will develop the resiliency Dr. Batiste mentioned earlier. That resiliency will actually negate some of the effects of the stressors that you will not be able to avoid and, and, and add years to your life. Can you tell the story about um, the Queen of England? You mentioned it. What, what story is that? <laughs> you were just talking about how she had all the resources. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They don't bring her any, any bad news, like the wind. No, no. Yeah, the Queen of no England has news. no demands. She just has resources. So she'll live forever. <laughs> she'll live forever, you know, right. You see her. I mean, she, you know, she don't look like she used to run marathons or nothing, but you see the Queen of England, she looks just as good as she did 10 years ago because she, she don't have to dress herself. She don't have to think about it. You know, if, if right now a bomb went off somewhere in the world, they won't even let her know. Like, don't tell the queen so she has the advantage of you know she of living a relatively now i don't know now that she now that she has some a person of uh, a sister done married into the family maybe the stress levels in the house have gone up but um she left. She left. She said, you know, I, I don't know but you know they may have some stress because of some of the stuff going on uh, mm -hmm. that she can't avoid but in general you know, they protect her and that lower stress it's the same reason why ceos um, and other people live longer. It's because they're in control and being able to make decisions um, allows you to mitigate stress. When you're the one just be at the just getting the brunt of the decision, you're the ones who gets the most stressed. Mm. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And then um, why did you guys cho choose the name Slave Food? For me, it's a twofold reason. One of them is because historically, slave food was the food given to African Americans that was rejected. It was the chitlins that we didn't talk about in this particular talk. If you watch our Juneteenth episode, I'll go back to that one and watch it. You'll see. Um, and so when you look at it, um, the food that the slaves got um, was really the food that the master would eat. The intestines of a pig, the foot of a pig, the chicken's neck bone, the chicken's feet, and on and on and on and on, you know, mm -hmm. spoiled foods. Um, and they were supposed to then survive on that food. Well, they've mm -hmm. learned to try and make the food taste as good as possible. Um, and fella, and in some ways that became quote unquote their food, but it was slave food and it was very unhealthy food. It was enough food um, to make you work all day, but not enough food to give you the strength to run and fight in a sense. Um, and so today it's still slave food. When you eat the junk food, processed food that is so highly addicting today, that makes you a slave to the food through its addiction, what are you really eating? It's the government subsidized high fructose corn syrup, uh, soybean oil, um, 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 uh, corn in many, many different forms. Um, and uh, what else, Columbus? There's a, a few other crops that the government totally supports. Everything like government cheese. I mean, all of these things are foods that basically was waste. The government cheese is from excess milk products that they turn into cheese. So it's a new form of slave food, food that will not make you the optimum person able to rise and fight, but at the same time addicts you. And in this case, really is trying to take your resources from you so that someone else can get wealthy. Yeah, yeah. And I, there's not much to add after that, that wonderful description. I mean, but when I think about slave food, I think historic, from a historical standpoint, is reflective of a period of time in, in American history where there was a mountain hill of stress facing certain communities. But also, it also is reflective of the resiliency to make something out of nothing. 
during that period of time. It's also reflective of the resiliency to grow crops to subsidize that were adding to the, their health, but after a long day's work. That as you fast forward now, Libyan communities, once again, that are strang strangled with stressors that are there from societal stressors, but also the absence, like uh, Dr. Walsh mentioned, of resources that are there that leads to this crucible of events. And so we're all enslaved. And the slave food is a manipulation of nutrition for profit and for power. And so at this fast forward now to the 20th, 21st century, we're looking at all of us are enslaved oh. to the food where we think we have a choice, but we're not. And that's really part of the issue that's there. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you for a great show. And we'll turn it back over to you guys to close. All right. Well, listen, I want to thank the Willis Avenue Church for hosting us this this afternoon. We're very appreciative. We're going to bring um, uh, Ms. Myers back on um, briefly too as well. We want to thank you for welcoming us into your, your virtual community <laughs> <laughs> and sharing the concepts here inside of New York. You guys are going to have to bring us in when everything kind of yeah. settles down. Yeah. We'd love to come there and have our, have, for me, my first visit to New York, I'd love to come there. But um, it's this, this information is important. And in and, and the research, what I can tell you is that I know that the Bronx at Brooklyn, you all have suffered tremendously under the weight of COVID and the coronavirus, yeah. but you've also yeah. suffered for years with health disparities and yeah. with the disparate care that's there and the resources. And so I think the time is now for a change and that, that change starts with education. And so any role that we can play, we're more than happy to do so. So thank you. You're welcome. And I just want to thank you too, Dr. Baptiste and Dr. Um, Walsh and Danette and the whole Slave Food team for coming here and bringing this program to us. It was certainly something profound and it's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, so in our communities, um, the wealth of information you just gave us, it's, it's staggering. And I'm seeing the comments, uh, some of the comments and the questions um, that people are definitely impressed and um, has been jolted um, about what we need to do to combat all of these stressors and things in our lives. Um, and so I'm thankful. I'm thankful for you too and all of you for um, this program. And for all of those who joined us, I think it's a lot of people more than just Willis Avenue Church, but all of those who joined in this program as well. Thank you guys. Thank all you. right. Well, we will be signing off. And for those of you who follow our next uh, show will be September 25th, where we will be hosting an infectious disease doctor out of Vanderbilt to really kind of go in depth a bit more into this twin dimmick that's uh, facing us. But we've enjoyed our time here at Willis Avenue Church, and we look forward to our next time meeting with you all. Amen. All right.